welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. High-level diplomatic contacts between the U.S. and China continue, while South Korea strives to build a mature relationship with China. Today, we'll look at China's tensions with the U.S. and South Korea and its role in solving the North Korean problem. We are determined that that competition not veer into conflict, which would be terrible for everyone involved. China's strategic relations continue to build on the basis of mutual respect and common interests. Lethal attacks aimed at advancing the North's goals of intimidating its neighbors. In the studio with me, Mr. John Culver, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. Mr. Culver was the National Intelligence Officer for East Asia on the National Intelligence Council from 2015 to 2018. He is a former Central Intelligence Agency Senior Intelligence Officer with 35 years of experience. Also joining us, Mr. Marcus Golovskis, Director of Indo-Pacific Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Golovskis was the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea on the National Intelligence Council until June of 2020. As NIO, Mr. Golovskis led the U.S. intelligence community's strategic analysis on North Korea. Welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks. Now, Mr. Golovskis, recently released National Intelligence Estimate says that North Korea will most likely use its nuclear weapons for coercive use, and the likelihood of offensive and defensive use is little. Now, North Korea most recently said that the Korean Peninsula is on the brink of a nuclear war. Is this part of North Korea's coercive strategy, or is there a possibility that North Korea put words into action? Uh, An Jung, I think it's absolutely part of their coercive strategy. Uh, when you look at the, the phrases that North Korea uses, we look at the threats that they, uh, that they put out, that is designed to, uh, to coerce, it's designed to incite fear, it's in designed to incite hesitation. Now that's not to say there isn't a possibility that at some point North Korea could take the offensive, but right now I think what we're seeing is class of uh, attempts uh, by North Korea to coerce. Mr. Culver, what is the level of U.S. determination to use overwhelming force to punish North Korean aggression on South Korea? Well, as President Biden said in April, if North Korea uses nuclear weapons, um, that it would be mark the end of the regime. So that's consistent with the U.S. policy going back decades over multiple administrations. Uh, it's really exemplified by the fact that we maintain a large number of troops in South Korea, that we have a joint command arrangement um, for uh, military contingencies, and that the U.S. continues to be uh, the main security guarantor, especially against North Korean nuclear coercion. Mr. Golovskis, there is progress in holding the first meeting of the nuclear consultative group, and there's a lot of reporting about Japan possibly joining trilateral extended deterrence consultations. Now, if North Korea uses nuclear weapons and strikes against South Korea, will the U.S. and South Korea most likely use nuclear weapons or conventional weapons or both? So let me build on what John just said. I think the key is what the objective would be. If North Korea were to launch a nuclear attack, the goal is going to be to ensure that that statement is not a bluff, that, that the regime is brought to an end. Um, and I think, depending on the specific circumstances, the best means available might be uh, conventional weapons, might be nuclear weapons, or a combination of the two. Uh, I think the operational factors to achieve that strategic goal are really the key. And the symbolism of responding a nuke for a nuke is uh, may not be the most important thing. The most important thing is to achieve the operational military objective, which is to defeat North Korea in that circumstance. And Mr. Golos, because North Korea is preparing for another satellite launch and its seventh nuclear test, 
Where is North Korea heading with all of this? Is there a strategy that we can make North Korea believe that having a nuclear weapon is actually threatens its security and not strengthens it? So, so to answer the last part first, I think Kim Jong-un personally, as the intelligence community in the United States keeps putting out, that Kim Jong-un personally believes that nuclear weapons are intimately connected to his survival and the regime's survival. I think the key is not to try and change Kim Jong-un's mind, um, but it's to develop an understanding among the North Korean elite, among the people around Kim and the people that would have to execute uh, Kim's decisions, uh, that possessing nuclear weapons and using nuclear weapons is going to lead to the end uh, of the North Korean regime system and that, it, that Kim Jong-un um, should not be in a position where he can uh, drive uh, the North Korea and its people to terrible uh, death and destruction uh, through following that path. So, so the, I think it's, it, the issue is convincing the, the uh, North Korean elite, the North Korean military, rather than trying to change uh, Kim Jong-un's mind on that. So your first part of the question, I think North Korea is, is heading on a path of continuing uh, what, uh, to execute what Kim Jong-un put forward as guidance uh, in the uh, Eighth Party Congress, and that is to continue to develop uh, a wide range of capabilities, and that does include military satellites, that does include various uh, types of tactical and strategic nuclear capability, and I think we're going to see tests and demonstrations of those capabilities in the future, including, as the North Koreans warned us, another attempt at a satellite launch. To follow up, so do you think there is a elite in North Korean military and in the government they have that have their own thinking, that they can influence Kim Jong-un, that Kim Jong-un doesn't have the total control of the government, doesn't have iron fist over everybody. This has been a controversy for a long time, whether there is such independence or not in the thinking of the North Korean elites. So, so I don't think it's a question of independence of thinking. It's a question of the fact that in order to execute his policies, at the end of the day, he needs the willing cooperation and support of the North Korean elite and the military. Mere obedience is not going to be enough to allow, allow him to really achieve his goals. Uh, and it's not even just about a situation in a day-to-day, a, -day, a period where the security services are, are going to be fully um, you know, able to monitor and, and to exercise uh, Kim's control. It, it really is most important to uh, affect the elite's thinking in those moments of crisis when, when Kim would push to the point where, where there could be huge consequences. Uh, and, and to undermine over time um, the, uh, the, the confidence of the, uh, the elite uh, and, and the people of North Korea in Kim Jong-un's leadership. And so I don't see you know, a rebellion, an uprising you know, anytime soon, but I think it's, it's very important to understand that North Korean elites, as much as they may be indoctrinated and as much as they be, may be bombarded with propaganda, as much as they may be monitored, at the end, they're human beings. They have their own interests uh, and they have their own ability to see the world. And if we can get them uh, the appropriate information and we can help them to understand that they don't need to tie their personal survival to Kim Jong-un's survival, I think it is possible to change minds over time. Mr. Culver, throughout the past year, North Korea made threats against the U.S. and South Korean alliance and more specifically about targeting airfield. Now, shouldn't the U.S. and South Korea also respond with a stronger warning and messaging, possibly even information campaign and information warfare? In 2017, James Clapper, the DNI, said that what does bother me a bit is that we don't capitalize on our great weapon, which is information. Mr. Clapper said the regime went nuts over information broadcast, loudspeaker broadcast across the DMZ. Do you think there is a need to, for United States to consider information warfare against North Korea? Well, I think we do live in an information age. Um, and while I defer to uh, Mr. Galaskis on whether broad, broad loudspeaker broadcasts are the right mode, um, I think we have to operate in a way that takes into account the impenetrability or relative impenetrability of the media environment and the information environment in North Korea but then use every means, um, especially uh, through uh, North Korea and ties to the outside world, including China, to be able to get true facts in front of them, to uh, undercut the propaganda line that the regime tends to immerse its population and leadership in. If any of you can take my question, do you think the U.S. government is preparing any of those information campaigns that we talked about targeting the North Korean elites? Yeah, so I think overall, the United States government has a long history of supporting getting information to the people of North Korea. But as um, many uh, friends and colleagues have pointed out, like um, uh, actually Sumi Terry just mentioned this yesterday, and, and uh, retired Colonel Dave Maxwell, another, another friend, points this out, we can do more. 
right? And so I don't think it's that the U.S. government is opposed to this, but we need more resources, we need more attention, and more importantly, we need more willingness to take risk because we have to understand when we pursue an information approach toward North Korea, this is going to threaten Kim Jong-un, and he is going to respond. He's going to respond against his own people, and he's going to threaten us, right? Just like what happened, um, you know, uh, two, two summers ago, uh, actually now, I guess three summers ago, with the, uh, with the threats about the balloon, the, the balloon launches. And so we have to be prepared for that. Um, so I think in principle, yes, the U.S. government um, understands this, but I think we need to do more and we need to push harder. Mr. Culver, North Koreans have a strong resentment over China, and Secretary Pompeo in his memoir also mentioned about North Korean animosity against China. What is your assessment of the true state of China-North Korea relations, and do you think there is a weak link between Beijing and Pyongyang that U.S. and South Korea can target? Uh, I, I think that people tend to overstate this animosity um, because at the same time that North Korea may want more direct Chinese support, re resent China's enforcement of UN sanctions, China is still the main lifeline for North Korea for food, for energy. So China has tremendous leverage over North Korea, but so far has not used it. You know, it's even allowed apparently um, North Korean ships to uh, transfer fuel and uh, do, it, do uh, uh, sanctions evading actions over coal, uh, sometimes uh, close to Chinese waters. So uh, while North Korea may not like the limits that China's placed on their relationship, China remains their main lifeline. Um, I think that the U.S. has always tried to get China to be more on side, and you saw intense efforts on that in 2017, um, when North Korea was really breaking out with its missile and nuclear testing. Um, and at that time, China did play, I think, a constructive role working directly with the United States. But in the context of now U.S.-China strategic rivalry, I think the prospects of that being, uh, let's say there's a new crisis, North Korea does a new nuclear test or fires long-range missiles um, as tests. Um, the idea that the U.S. is then going to turn to the Chinese and get the same kind of assistance and cooperation that we did in 2017, I think, is pretty low. Um, I think that the irritants in the U.S.-China relationship become much more dominant in the last five years. In North Korea, North Koreans say China is 1,000-year enemy, Japan is 100-year enemy, and there was reporting that Xi Jinping despised Kim Jong-un. What do you think is Chinese officials' sentiment towards the North Korean elites and Kim Jong-un regime? Uh, I think they see Kim as kind of like a continuation of his father and grandfather, a, a problem rather than an ally. I mean, the two countries are still nominally have a mutual defense treaty. Um, but the Chinese have demonstrated over um, past crises on the Korean Peninsula, um, stability over um, uh, security issues especially, that there are real constraints that China puts on those treaty obligations. Um, so I can see where Kim is frustrated, um, but at the same time Xi Jinping has to be very frustrated because you know, he has uh, a nominal ally on his near frontier who continues to create security and, and instability problems in Northeast Asia. Um, it might be that uh, if there is a more, uh, a more dire cr crisis in security on the peninsula, that China will have to reassess. But I think even in the worst case, even if a war broke out on the Korean peninsula, I don't think China would come in to aid North Korea. I think China would go into North Korea in order to secure its own interests. Mr. Culver, isn't Chinese assertiveness the reason why Asian countries are joining in on U.S. efforts to strengthen alliances and partnerships? Doesn't the Chinese government realize that its own actions are making countries uniting against that country? Uh, I think the Chinese do realize it, but treat it as a problem they have to manage. And there they have more confidence that while there is greater U.S. investment in its allies, especially in East Asia over the last uh, three years, that in the period prior to that, the U.S. had treated their allies somewhat cavalierly. And so there's some repair work being done by the Biden administration for the damage that was done to some of these alliances, or really not the alliances themselves, but confidence mm -hmm. in the U.S. commitment. Um, but at the same time, you know, the Chinese are conscious that, for example, they are, China, they are South Korea's largest trading partner, that China is the largest manufacturing country in the world, that it has the first or largest gross domestic product in the world, and that China has far deeper trade links throughout East Asia and even beyond than even the United States does. So the United States is now not that interested in multilateral trade agreements. China is deeply invested in multilateral trade including RCEP and including uh, the CPPTT, uh, which it's applied to, uh, to join. 
So they, they think that they know they have a problem. They would disagree that it's because of Chinese assertiveness. They would say it's because of U.S. containment. I'm not endorsing that argument, but I think they view these as all challenges that they can manage, that they don't have to decide or pick between one or the other. Mr. Goloskos, on that alliance relationship, how reliable and trustworthy is South Korea as an ally? Japan has very consistent alignment with the United States, whereas in South Korea, depending on the government, their approach to U.S. and North Korea and China is drastically different. And in which case, do you think there could be some concerns on the U.S. side over the resilience of South Korean alignment with the U.S. policies? So I think there's no question that in many parts of Washington there is concern about South Korea as an ally and, and uh, where, where South Korea sits, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China issues. Um, however, I think um, that's a bit unfair um, because it's based more on the public messaging that's coming out of Seoul rather than watching Seoul's actions. And it's also based on perhaps the fact that uh, to be fair, I think Seoul is being a little bit too subtle sometimes. So, uh, so when when a South Korean president talks about peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and doesn't mention China, um, it might be a little too clever by half. Beijing still gets upset, but Washington says, "Well, why aren't they actually mentioning China by name?" Right? And so, so there's a lot of people in Washington I think that see the alliance as glass half empty. But in reality, look at all the things that South Korea has been doing. Look at the importance of. Um, the ROK US alliance in this in this really central uh, you know area critical area you know as the linchpin ally in the Indo-Pacific Alliance network and then look also for example what South Korea is doing um, to support NATO I mean the, the huge shipments of arms going from South Korea to Poland but then Americans complain oh well they're not shipping arms directly to Ukraine well that's beside the point the point is that South Korea is contributing to larger security goals but because of the concerns in Seoul understandable about being targeted by Chinese uh, economic coercion and, and really antagonizing Beijing, Seoul treads a little bit carefully in the public messaging. But I think at the, at the end of the day, the U.S. and South Korea have a mutual defense treaty that's celebrating its 70th anniversary this year that, that really I think Americans need to give more credit to, to South Korea. Is the line's perfect? No. Could South Korea do more? Yes. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's an image problem even more so than it is any sort of real structural problem in the alliance. Well, in the previous government, high-level government officials publicly went out and said that they are balancing between Washington and Beijing. Korean ambassador to United States said that South Korea is now at a place where South Korea can choose its own partner between U.S. and China. Another high-level official said that South Korea is cooperating with the U.S. on the security and cooperating with China on the economy. So it is true that the previous administration had drastically different view of how to approach U.S. and China relations. Well, I, I think actually a lot of that was for show. I think at the end of the day, um, there's, there's no Chinese forces Korea, there's U.S. forces Korea. So from a security standpoint, the alliance is very clear and very strong. But even on the economic standpoint, well, look at what's going on this year. My, my recollection of the stats is actually that South Korea exported more um, to the United States uh, than to China this year, right? And so, so I think there is an understanding that those relationships do in some way need to be balanced, right? I mean, the, that it's not like the ROK can only trade with the United States, not with China. Um, but, but I think uh, when you look at the substance of what was really going on, uh, again, I think the, uh, the, the Moon administration was being quite clever. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the alliance uh, and the partnership with the United States was still uh, quite strong. And, and to be fair, there were a lot of statements um, that, uh, that were coming out of Seoul even back then, including that mention of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait that were directly in opposition to what Beijing wanted. And of course, ultimately, the Moon administration, although somewhat reluctantly, followed through on deployment of the THAAD battery um, to the Republic of Korea. And I think that's a testament um, to the strength of the alliance. And the fact of the matter is, as much as uh, Seoul hedges a little bit around the edges, South Koreans have made their choice. The U.S. is the preferred partner and the ally. Can't take South Korea for granted, um, but I think we should, uh, we should give credit where credit is due that, uh, that either side of the aisle um, has, has certainly uh, uh, been willing to do things that China doesn't want and, and been willing to prioritize the U.S. at the end of the day when the chips are down. Mr. Culver, both Washington and Beijing made clear that they want to defuse tensions. South Korea's opposition party is criticizing the Yoon song nyeol government that South Korea is only left with strained ties with China after aligning with U.S.'s China strategy. Do you think South Korea, we just talked about this with mm -hmm. Mr. Goloskos, that South Korea should take balanced approach between Washington and Beijing 
rather than just following U.S. lead in strengthening the alliance? Well, I think, as Mr. Galaskis just said, South Korea isn't you know, just a follower, that it, it's looking after its own interests. And I think with regard to China, it is more complicated in some ways. Um, South Korea is a, a big producer of semiconductors that are a critical policy focus of the United States uh, and its allies right now. And I, I think that you know, choices that we're making uh, that affect South Korea are going to have to be discussed. So um, I, I think overall, the Chinese make it somewhat easier in their heavy-handed approach and their previous use of economic coercion, for example, over the THAAD battery. But I think generally we're pretty well aligned right now. That doesn't mean there won't be hard choices, especially over the uh, semiconductor de-risking that the U.S. is leading an effort on that does affect you know, South Korea as the, the other great producer of advanced semiconductors in addition to Taiwan. Um, but I think they're not, none of these are insurmountable problems. They remain, as they always are, things to be managed in a complex bilateral relationship. Mr. Culver, China's People's Daily carried the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson's comments that China values remains committed to growing China ROK ties. The current Yoon Sung Nyeol government holds the line on Chinese actions, whereas the previous government was more appeasing on China. Do you think South Korea should deal with China from a position of strength? Uh, I, I think it, it, it does deal from a position of strength as a U.S. ally, as a host of U.S. forces on the peninsula, that those are bedrock. You know, they're not things that are going to be subject to a change of administration easily, either in Seoul or in Washington. Um, and so I, I think there, the, the best thing is to be aligned uh, on strategic principles and in the context of U.S.-China rivalry, which is a policy priority for the Biden administration um, that we have now defined over the last two administrations, China, as our pacing strategic challenge, that uh, South Korea needs predictable actions by Washington, they need closer alignment, and they need to uh, not be surprised, uh, either, especially by the United States. Um, I think on the whole, uh, South Korea will, like our other allies, is going to be a, a, a partner we're going to have to pay attention to. I mean, one of the frustrations some allies have is Washington is great at announcing policies and not always good at socializing them, especially among friends and allies. I, I think that we're getting better at that, but it's going to be something as this rivalry plays out where it's going to be a source of tension that has to be managed. Mr. Koloskas, U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, Ambassador Goldberg told South Korean media that the U.S. will stand with South Korea against Chinese economic retaliation. What was his messaging? Is there some regret on the U.S. side that U.S. didn't support South Korea enough during the THAAD incident? Yeah, so I think the situation with Chinese economic coercion, um, with Beijing's economic coercion, has evolved a great deal um, in, in the almost a decade uh, since the, the, the THAAD was sort of one of the major test cases. And so I think there is a recognition that not only um, is it important that the U.S. support countries uh, under uh, economic coercion, but also that, uh, that throughout the whole world, and particularly in the Indo-Pacific, countries need to support each other when they're faced by this. Collectively, the ability to resist um, is very real. And so, so I do think um, that there, there is a recognition that, that the United States can and should do more um, to mobilize and to support um, when, when a country is targeted by economic coercion. But at the end of the day, the economic coercion backfired, right? Is that the South Korean people resoundingly uh, said that we are not going to be pushed around um, by, by China. Well, we have so much more to talk about, but that's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Galoskas, Mr. Culver, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back here next week with U.S. experts to discuss the two Koreas and the region right here from Washington.